people of the Bahamas. God has not changed his mind about your future. Don't doubt that. Don't doubt who you are. He is your father. You are his child. the shores of beautiful Nassau, Bahamas. Welcome to Walking in Victory with Bishop Neil C. Ellis. The powerful and prophetic ministry of Bishop Neil C. Ellis is impacting the lives of believers all around the world. His bold and forthright presentation of spiritual truths and biblical principles is sure to change your life forever. Get ready to experience a fresh approach to ministry as this anointed author and pastor teaches us how to walk in victory. Walking in victory. Well, God bless you today, and I want to welcome you to another edition of Walking in Victory. This is Neil Ellis, and I'm so delighted to be sharing with you today. Last week, we started the Winning the War series, and we focused in on winning the war over worry. Today, I am going to deal with a subject winning the war over doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, though we are Christians, we do not live in a problem-proof, make-believe, fairy tale, question-free world. We live in a world where doubt is never far away. Paul Tillich, that great German-American philosopher and theologian once said, that doubt is not the opposite of faith, it's an element of faith. Struggling with God, my friends, does not mean we lack faith. Struggling with God is a sure sign that we truly have faith. If we have no faith, there would probably be no struggle. And if we never have a struggle, it would be very difficult for our faith to grow. Many assume that the more faith we have, the fewer questions we will ask. But the Bible offers a different picture about the nature of faith altogether, one in which faith and doubt are woven much closer together than we might wish to imagine. Doubt impacts all of us. If doubt challenges us and we do not act, our doubt grows. But if we challenge our doubts with action, then we grow. If during these COVID-19 days, you've been feeling emotionally bankrupt, socially depressed, and financially challenged, hold on my friend got to come to grips with the fact that God has plans for your life and the plans he has for your life do not include evil do not include evil at all don't doubt that I want you to pay attention to this message and I'll talk to you at the end of the telecast of Jesus is a gift from God and the fulfillment of his promise. It is the very foundation 
of our faith. It is the central focus of Christianity because the resurrection of Jesus is really the basis of our theology. Jesus, though he was brutally crucified, was raised again from the dead. And Christianity stands and falls on this single point. Were it not for the resurrection of Christ, the Christian religion would be no different from any other religion. Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and today he yet lives. There is no other leader of any other religion that can boast of the fact that their leader died and rose again. But the Christian religion boasts of the fact that we serve a risen Savior. Oh, praise his name. Were it not for the resurrection, our preaching would be in vain. Our faith would be fruitless. After his resurrection and before he ascended into heaven, Jesus spent 40 days on the earth proving that he had in fact been raised from the dead. Our text today deals with one of those post-resurrection experiences recorded in the gospel according to John. Let's keep in mind now that John was a different kind of writer from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The gospel of John was not written to get the facts out. The Gospel of John was written with the assumption that people already knew the facts about Jesus' life. When you read and study the Gospel of John, you enter into a world of symbols and verses that have at least two to three levels of meanings. John is highly, highly selective about the material that he uses in his uh, account of, of Jesus' life. But because people don't always realize that John in his gospel is speaking symbolically, philosophically, and metaphorically, they oftentimes miss the real message that John is seeking to convey to his readers. So whenever you study the gospel according to John, you have to start out with the assumption that the message John wants to convey is below the surface, below the details of the story, simply because John is not writing to give his readers information. But John is all about the task of giving people revelation. Now, having said all of that, one conclusion we might uh, draw from close scrutiny of our text is that in spite of the bad rap that has been placed on Thomas, John seeks to convey that Thomas is really no different from the other disciples. Everything in this text that took place on resurrection day showed that Jesus' followers did not expect him to be resurrected from the dead. So doubts and fears quit them. Mary Magdalene actually believed somebody had removed Jesus' body. Peter went to the empty tomb and wondered what happened. Mary thought Jesus was the gardener and asked if he knew where they had hidden Jesus' body. 
the disciples didn't believe Mary's report. When Jesus appeared, the disciples were afraid and thought he was a ghost. Thomas didn't believe the other disciples' report. My brothers and sisters, Professor and author Gary Habermius writes, Doubt is certainly one of the most frequent and painful problems which plague Christians. Doubt is when a person finds himself between belief and disbelief. It involves uncertainty or distrust or lack of sureness of an alleged fact, an action, a motive, or a decision which may consequently cause you to delay or reject relevant action. As Christian believers, there are times the things happen in our lives where we cannot make good sense of our faith. And in those times, doubt creeps in. Noah doubted he could build an ark. Moses doubted he could take on Pharaoh and free his people. Gideon doubted God's call on his life. Sarah doubted she could have children. Mary doubted the message the angel Gabriel brought her. And the list goes on and on. Many of the heroes of the Bible did not earn their title because they believed without doubt. But they did so because they had faith with doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, though we are Christians... We do not live in a problem, proof, make believe, fairy tale, question free world. We live in a world where doubt is never far away. Paul Tillich, that great German American philosopher and theologian, once said that doubt is not the opposite of faith, it's an element of faith. Mother Teresa of Calcutta is primarily remembered for her selfless service to the poor and sick. But a book of letters printed after her death revealed that even she struggled with doubt about her faith at times. Along with his legacy of being a reformer and father of the Protestant movement, Martin Luther is also remembered for a less grand and much more relatable trait. Doubt. Luther's primary doubts about his faith, his thinking, and his relationship with God would go on to haunt him later on in life. But even a church father of the stature of, of Martin Luther still suffered from moments of doubt about his calling and what God thought about him. One of history's greatest preachers, Charles Spurgeon, was not only a master of communicating deep truths of scriptures, but also of engaging with his audience and relating to their struggles. In his sermon, Desire of the Soul in Spiritual Darkness, he bluntly claimed, I think when a man says I never doubt, it is quite time for us to begin doubting him. Since he was elected as leader of the Catholic Church in the spring of 2013, Pope Francis has been widely popular and massively influential both inside the church and to the broader world. According to Time Magazine, he's undoubtedly been the most popular pope in recent memory. But Pope Francis has openly spoken about the role of doubt in faith. Listen to him. Who among us has not experienced insecurity, loss, and even doubts on their journey of faith? 
We've all experienced this. Me too, he says. It is part of the journey of faith. It is part of our lives because we are human beings marked by fragility and limitations. We are all weak and we all have limits. I use those as examples to point to the fact that doubt impacts all of us. If doubt challenges us and we do not act, our doubts grow. But if we challenge our doubts with action, then we grow. For Thomas, his worst fears proved true when Jesus was crucified on Calvary. Thomas was so grief stricken that he could not bear the thought of life without Jesus. He was afraid, confused, ashamed, dismayed, distressed. Thomas had followed Jesus for three years. And now it all came crashing down on him. And to have Jesus crucified literally shattered his world. He couldn't take it. So he chose not to hang out with the other disciples. Where Thomas went, we don't know. What he was doing, there's no record of it. Why he stayed away, we don't know for sure. But for whatever reason, Thomas did not go back to hang out in the locked room with the other disciples where they were assembled because of fear. Consequently, Thomas lost out on one of the fellowships of the other disciples, but more importantly, he did not get to see Jesus on that first Easter evening. He missed it. He missed the appearance of the resurrected Savior. He had to hear about it secondhand. And here is the account in verses 24 and 25. Now Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. Mm -hmm. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. We have seen the Lord, Thomas. Go ahead. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hands into his side, I will not believe. As far as Thomas was concerned, there was no way anything good could come out of what he saw on that good Friday. Then he said to Thomas, Come Thomas, reach your finger here. I know what you're looking for. And look at my hand. I know what you need now. And reach your hand here. You need exactly what the other fellas need when I showed up the first time. And put it into my side. And do what? Do not be unbelieving. But what? But believing. Jesus knew the heart of Thomas. And he did, he did two things. One, he offered him exactly what he was asking for. And two, he gave him the proof he needed. And when Thomas got the proof, ladies and gentlemen, there is no record that Thomas ever put his finger in Jesus' hand and never put his hand in Jesus' side. But verse 28 tells us his response. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord my and my Lord God. My Lord and my God. Thomas goes from demanding evidence to declaring truth. And he makes one of the greatest statements of faith in the entire New Testament. The same person we call Doubting Thomas. When he said, my Lord and my God, what he was saying was, Jesus is the Lord of all things and the God of all creation. What got in Thomas' way between then and now? Doubt. But ladies and gentlemen, the resurrection story teaches us, one, we are not out because of doubt. Two, you can be a follower of Jesus and at the same time struggle with doubts. And three, you don't have to have it all together and have all your doubts worked out to follow Jesus.
Those who literally walk with Jesus, ate with Jesus, and lived with Jesus, didn't have all their doubts worked out. And not only did Jesus let them follow him, but he made good use of them. Verse 29, Delton, let's wrap it up. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, well, you have believed. Watch, watch this now. Watch this now. Let's take that slowly. Read that for me again. Jesus said to him, Thomas, uh -huh. because, you, because have, you have seen me, go ahead. You have believed. That's why you believe. Go ahead. Blessed are those. But blessed are those who have not seen me and yet believe. Ladies and gentlemen, wherever you are, that's us. Jesus told his disciples he was going to die and be raised up on the third day. They believed that when he told them. But what they saw, Good Friday, confused them and created doubt. Their doubt became a distraction to the truth. Hmm. Many of you blessed people under the sound of my voice know what God said to you about what you should expect this year. Hear me. Don't allow your reality, your circumstances, this global pandemic or your time of isolation to confuse you. Don't allow what your eyes are seeing to determine what your mind believes and what your heart will receive. Doubt sees the obstacle. Faith sees the way. Doubt sees the darkest night. Faith sees the light of day. Doubt dreads to take a step. Faith soars on high. But doubt questions who believes and faith answers, here am I. As I bring this message to a close. If today, because of all that's going on around you, you've been feeling perplexed, unsettled, confused, or nervous, you are a blessed child of God. And God is not true with you yet. Don't Doubt that. If during these COVID-19 days, you've been feeling emotionally bankrupt, socially depressed, and financially challenged, hold on, child of God. God has plans for your life, and the plans do not include evil. Don't doubt that. Our eternal God is our refuge and underneath are his everlasting arms. Don't doubt that. According to Psalm 103, he forgives all of our iniquities. Don't doubt that. He heals all of our diseases. Don't doubt that. He redeems our lives from destruction. Don't doubt that. If you are struggling in any area of your life, know that God loves you and truly cares about you and the things will get Better. Don't doubt that. Don't scale down your dreams. Don't minimize God's plans for your life. Don't give up on what's been in your spirit. People of the Bahamas, God has not changed his mind about your future. Don't doubt that. Don't doubt who you are. Family, friends, he's your father, and you are his child. And because he's your father, and because you're his child, he's your protector, he's your provider, he's your sustainer. Don't doubt that. He's the source of everything that you need. He loves you, he cares about you. He never deserts you. He'll never let you down with or without a job. Don't doubt that.
Well, 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 we've come to the end of today's program, even though we're not out of message. I do hope and pray that this message on winning the war over doubt has helped you to do just that. I want you to walk away from this telecast today knowing that even if you have doubts, you are not out because of doubt. In the meantime, whatever else you do for the rest of this week, remember you've been anointed, my friends, to walk in victory. I'll talk to you next week. Stay connected with Neil Ellis Ministries via our social media networks. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Here you'll find daily inspiration, motivational quotes, photos, and videos. Don't want to miss another live event? Follow us on live stream. You can do this by either downloading the app or by visiting www.livestream.com. You will have access to Bishop Ellis' weekly television broadcast, live events, and so much more. Follow us today and stay connected. Bishop Neil C. Ellis' latest book, The In-Between, The Journey Between Your Dream and Your Destiny, is creating a lot of buzz. People from all walks of life are talking. Devon Franklin says The In-Between is a must-read for anyone in pursuit of their destiny and in need of encouragement along the way. TV host and pop culture expert John Murray says this insightful roadmap to achieving your best life will show you why Bishop Ellis has earned the distinction of being your favorite leader's favorite leader. International attorney Willie E. Gary says The In-Between is a literary masterpiece. Dr. Jamal H. Bryant says reading this book will invigorate you to push to the end. My Bishop has penned a prescription for people who are in between so that you breathe in the go-between. Dr. Carolyn Showell raves it's a revelatory resource that serves as a roadmap, showing us the way to next, leading you out of your stagnation and into perpetual movement in God. Dr. Kenneth C. Ulmer writes, Neil Ellis takes you on a journey filled with exhortations, instructions, and revelations on the value, the mandate, and significance of doing your assignment. Get your copy today and let's see what you have to say. Bishop Neil C. Ellis' The End Between, The Journey Between Your Dream and Your Destiny. Now available at Amazon.com, Booksamillion.com, BarnesandNoble.com, or anywhere books are sold. Bishop Neil C. Ellis and the Mount Tabor Church family in Nassau, Bahamas, wish to thank you for viewing the Walking in Victory broadcast and invite you to tune in next week to experience this powerful prophetic ministry. Should you wish to correspond with Bishop Ellis, please write him at P.O. Box N9705, Nassau, Bahamas, or email him at info at neilellisministries.com. Walking in Victory